so much. Um, hello and welcome everyone to the presentation on inclusion in the built environment. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to say a very special thank you to Better Buildings Bootcamp and Sustainable Buildings Canada for including human space in this year's event. So my first name is Haley Ray and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm an accessibility specialist working with Human Space, a consultancy of BDP Quadrangle. At Human Space, our human-centered approach creates spaces, buildings, and communities that consider people first and incorporates broad perspectives to arrive at better solutions. This means pursuing a comprehensive approach to community building that includes accessibility, wellness, and inclusion as essential components to creating safe, equitable, and resilient built environments. Our forward thinking solutions go above and beyond traditional expectations, and we work with our clients and partners to achieve project goals in a way that considers everyone and benefits us all. Our approach to problem solving includes the human-centered experience in all aspects of our work. Human Space has successfully delivered more than 200 projects over the past decade, spanning healthcare, residential, workplace, hospitality, recreation, ec education, transportation, and public realm. Our consulting work is grounded in over 30 years of experience with a team specialized to support our clients' needs. Human Space is a consultancy of BDP. So some key topics to move us towards a better understanding of inclusion in the built environment um, will include accessibility, universal design, and inclusive design, disability, a look at exclusion in the built environment, and then we'll round it out with specifically inclusion in the built environment. Related to the topic of accessibility, universal design, and inclusive design, let's begin thinking about the question, how we shape the built environment. Let's review some definitions that you should be aware of. Accessibility means the qualities that make an experience open to all. A professional discipline aimed at achieving the qualities that make an experience open to all. The Ontario Building Code defines barrier free when applied to a building and its facilities and the building and its facilities can be approached, entered and used by persons with physical or sensory disabilities. Note the nuances and perhaps gaps that exist between these two terms. If you, live in North America, if you live in a North American city and you don't personally use a mobility device, it's easy to overlook the small ramp at most intersections between the sidewalk and the street. Today, these curb cuts are everywhere. But 50 years ago, when an activist named Ed Roberts was young, most urban corners featured a sharp drop off, making it difficult for him and other mobility device users to get between blocks without assistance. A quote by Lawrence Carter Long, says, if you're trying to get across the street and there are no curb cuts, six inches might as well be Mount Everest. Back in the 40s and 50s, there were a few communities across North America where people had tried to make elements of the built environment more accessible. By the mid 70s, the disability rights movement was growing and spreading with groups around the world advocating for changes in the built environment to enable more independence. And by 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA was established as a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination based on disability. In Canada, it was not until 2005 that the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act or the AODA came into force and not until 2019 that the Accessible Canada Act or the ACA did the same. Here's just a very brief look at some of those same um, legislative requirements that we looked at. We see uh, the Accessible Canada Act, um, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, specifically the Design of Public Spaces Standards, which is the Built Environment Standard, um, as well as the Building Code, and all of those sort of in relation to or in context of the Ontario Human Rights Code, for example, um, and where those sort of stand um, with regard to any municipal standards as well that we may be considering the, in the built environment. Thinking about symbols of access. So the international symbol of access, which we see on the left-hand side here, um, was popularized by the Swedish Handicap Institute in 1969. Uh, this sign has become internationally accepted as the means of indicating places that are barrier free or accessible. I think there's a couple things wrong with this international symbol of access. Um, the current sign depicts a stationary person with an emphasis on the wheelchair. Portrayed in this way, the focus is put on the wheelchair and the disability before the person. 
in 2013, um, individuals looking to create a more up-to-date accessible icon developed the dynamic symbol of access and co-founded the Accessible Icon Project. Changing the accessible icon, like changing the language that we use to refer to persons with disabilities, frames the way our society views disability. And that's why the Forward Movement, which is an Ontario-based organization, wants Ontario to legislate the updated icon. It's important to note that while these two symbols um, largely represent, um, again, symbols of access in the built environment, mobility-related disability types only represent about 10% of persons with disabilities in Canada, um, as determined by uh, the latest sort of published study on um, the survey on disability, which we'll look at in a few more slides. Universal design can be defined as the design and composition of an, of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. In short, we may consider universal design as one size fits all. Now this image shows the tag on a piece of clothing, um, and I can certainly attest to you know, purchasing clothes in the past that say one size fits all, um, and they do not in fact <laughs> fit all. Um, looking at the principles of universal design, we have tolerance for error, perceptible information, low physical effort, equitable use, simple and intuitive use, size and space, and flexibility in use. And these are all principles that we can look to implement in the built environment, but it's important to understand um, that the guidelines related to each of these principles are more uh, qualitative in their descriptions um, and do require further analysis um, of how those qualitative requirements can be paired and matched with um, quantitative requirements to, to ensure both are achieved. We, almost, we may also look to the eight goals of universal design, um, and these include body fit, comfort, awareness, understanding, wellness, social integration, personalization, and cultural appropriateness. And then if we move on to inclusive design, this can be defined as a methodology originally born out of digital environments, um, but that enables and draws on the full range of human diversity. Most importantly, this means including and learning from people with a range of perspectives. In short, one size fits one. So again, universal design, one size fits all, and inclusive design, one size fits one. The three principles of inclusive design, um, the first being recognize exclusion. So designing for inclusivity not only opens up our products and services to more people, it also reflects how people really are. All humans grow and adapt to the world around them, and we want our designs to reflect that. Principle two, solve for one and extend to many. Everyone has abilities and limits to those abilities. Designing for people with permanent disabilities actually results in designs that benefit people universally. Constraints are a beautiful thing. And learn from diversity. Human beings are the real experts in adapting to diversity. Inclusive design puts people in the center from the very start of the process, and those fresh, diverse perspectives are the key to true insight. Related to the topic of disability, let's think about the question, how the built environment shapes us. The World Health Organization defines disability as not just a health problem, but as a complex phenomenon. Disability is a mismatched interaction between the features of a person's body and the features of the environment in which they live. Takeaway here is we have control over those features of the environment in our designs, in the buildings that we strive to design better. Now let's consider the new data on disability in Canada in 2017. The Canadian Survey on Disability covered Canadians aged 15 years and over whose everyday activities are limited because of a long-term condition or a health-related problem. Findings here noted that 22% of Canadians report to have a disability, and the most common type of disability is pain-related. Note, earlier this year, um, there has been news indicating that we can look forward to new data on disability um, uh, with the 2022 stamp, um, so look out for that very soon. I'm not sure when it'll be published, but sure it'll build on these same um, statistics that we so often refer to. So persons with disabilities include a range of disability types. 
At Human Space, we often think about persons with cognitive disabilities and neurodiversity, persons who are deaf and hard of hearing, persons using mobility devices, persons with limited stamina and limited dexterity, persons who are blind or have low vision, persons of short stature, and many more. Our past, present, and future selves exist with a range of abilities, and those abilities can fluctuate. Consider how our built environment shapes us. How can we identify, remove, and prevent the mismatches? What are the design strategies that provide accessibility for each of these disability types? Are they the same solutions? Are there any tensions that exist? Related to the topic of exclusion in the built environment, let's think about the question, how the built environment makes us feel excluded. So here we have an example of ableism. Um, on the left-hand side, we on the left-hand side of the screen, we see a very typical grand staircase um, at a very important building as being the main prominent entrance of this piece of architecture. Um, this happens to be the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And on the right hand side, um, we see a snapshot from history um, known as the Capitol Crawl. And here, a group of um, uh, individuals um, uh, from the disability community crawled up the steps of the Capitol in Washington in 1990 to draw support for a key bill um, at that time pending in the House that would extend civil rights to disabled persons. So that bill that we, the ADA that we spoke about in 1999, this was leading up to that. And again, this grand um, entrance had this grand staircase um, that uh, the disability community was not able to access. Related to ableism by design, I just wanna review, what do we mean by ableist? What do we mean by ableism? So. An ableist belief system often underlies negative attitudes, stereotypes, and stigma toward persons with disabilities. And ableism refers to attitudes in society that devalue and limit the potential of persons with disabilities. It may be defined as a belief system analogous to racism, sexism, or ageism, which we'll speak about that, those, those ideas in relation to design in a few slides. Um, but that sees persons with disabilities as being less worthy of respect and consideration, less able to contribute and participate or of less inherent value than others. It may be conscious or unconscious and may be embedded in institutions, systems of the broader culture of a society. It can limit the opportunities of persons with disabilities and reduce their inclusion in, life of, in the life of their communities. Some more examples of ableism by design. Um, we see the uh, element of strands implemented um, at various uh, locations here. Um, some of these are done in a way that um, uh, do try and implement accessibility features to make them a little less uh, less of a barrier for folks. Um, but increasingly, the idea of stramps um, continues to be um, an element that creates barriers, especially for folks with, with low to no vision, um, those navigating with either a guide dog or a white cane, um, and then problematic for folks using mobility devices as well. An example of, again, ableism by design are our hangout steps, which again, we see implemented at these you know, very prominent institutions, um, which get a lot of use for some people, but certainly do find a way to exclude many others. Thinking about ableist language and visualizations, um, ableist language is any word or phrase that devalues persons who have a disability. Though often inadvertent, ableist language suggests that persons with disabilities are abnormal. Ableism isn't simply a list of words we should not use, but paying attention to language can help us understand how embedded ableism really is in our communities. Common, ling common examples of ableist language are words like handicap, lame, dumb, retarded, idiot, imbecile, nuts, psycho, and spaz. These terms can be associated with a person's identity or their challenge, and because of that, can be interpreted as insulting or hurtful. And every time people use them, they reinforce the idea that persons with disabilities are somehow inferior. Many of these words and phrases are used so casually that most don't consciously realize they're associated with disability. Remember that you're not a bad person or an ally if you've used these words before, but if you have the ability to change the language you use, it's important to be aware of how language can perpetuate ableism. The 
or the image on the right, um, again, ableist visualization. Um, the idea here um, to emphasize um, active living, um, you know, a, a plug for uh, not using electricity. Um, but to consider how this visualization may come across to persons with limited mobility or persons using mobility devices in situations where um, uh, the built environment locates feature stairs and as the prominent feature um, and, and tucks away uh, elevators, um, it's really important that we co-locate um, where stairs are provided with those accessible means of, of vertical circulation, such as ramps or elevators, lifts, et cetera. Sexism by design. So while these images aren't necessarily related to the built environment, I think we can agree on a common feeling they bring up. And bringing this example to the built environment, picture yourself at a theater, an auditorium, or a sports center during the intermission or halftime, where only gendered multi-stall washrooms are provided, and the line for the female washroom is four times that or more of the male. Spending your whole break waiting in line for the washroom isn't exactly fair, um, and just wanted to highlight that there are gaps in the minimum requirements in our codes and standards to account for these uses and in these spaces of these specific scenarios. Um, so it's just really important that we understand, again, the use of our spaces, who our users are, and what that balance of these um, common amenity spaces are. Gender exclusion and transphobia by design. So again, thinking about washrooms, the symbolism here, typical sort of um, female, male pictograms representing multi-stall washrooms. So situations where only male and female washrooms are provided is a form of gender exclusion and transphobia in design. Um, and while universal washrooms um, can help fill that gap, um, awareness is certainly growing about um, the importance of including gender inclusive washrooms. This illustration, similar to the sexism example, um, I think it brings out a feeling, and maybe this is more related to employment, um, but I can think of examples in the built environment, such as you know, trendy new restaurants that certainly have not been designed to make older adults or seniors feel welcome. And for example, the design of the lighting or the acoustics or the furniture or even the menus. Um, I've been to establishments where one pair of reading glasses are being shared by multiple people because the menu is simply not perceivable. And by the end of our meal, we all admit that we couldn't hear anyone else from across the table simply by the design of the built environment around us. With this image, racism by design, let's think about the feeling that these photos evoke. I would argue that it's similar to the frustration and lack of dignity among many other feelings folks feel when they discover that the accessible entrance is around the back or that the elevator is the freight elevator and that the only washroom is in the basement. Um, or in addition to that, that the only place to pump for lactation is a washroom stall. Not quite dignified. Here are some examples of some racist landmarks that make us feel excluded. And then here, consideration um, for uh, the history of segregation by design and the exclusionary laws and policies that have shaped and continue to shape our cities. How the built environment makes us feel included. So by now, we should, have, we should have a better understanding of exclusion in the built environment. And it tends to include a laundry list of historical, political, and social contexts, as well as isms, phobias, and bias. So again, related to the topic of inclusion in the built environment, let's explore the question, how the built environment makes us feel included. It's important that we acknowledge the grounds of protection under the Ontario Human Rights Code. Um, they include consideration for age, ancestry, color and race, citizenship, ethnic origin, place of origin, creed, disability, family status, marital status, including single status, gender identity and gender expression, receipt of public assistance and housing only, record of offenses and employment only, 
sex, including pregnancy and breastfeeding, as well as sexual orientation. Pulling disability out of this list, um, it's important to think about the duty to accommodate, um, but also think about an individual's intersectional identities. Intersectionality is a theory and analytical framework coined by African-American scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. It helps us to understand how various aspects of our identities, such as race, class, gender, overlap. And these create interconnected forms of discrimination. This scholarship is increasingly applied to restorative justice, healthcare, and city building, as it enables professionals to mitigate systemic and spatial barriers. So consider how should the built environment design for intersectionality? Consider how you might design for a black queer woman with autism. How do you ensure a sense of physical, emotional, mental, social, and spiritual well-being in the built environment with consideration for this individual's intersectional identities? Some examples of specific design strategies that can contribute to how we can feel more included in the built environment. Consider how you may implement accessible pickup and drop off areas. Um, consider how you may implement accessible parking spaces, all within close proximity to the main accessible entrance. Consideration for um, accessible service counters and, and waiting areas. Um, we see here uh, ample sort of knee clearance provided both at the public side and staff side of this particular service counter. Um, and the counter itself is at that seated level. Um, in some cases, counters may be designed where a portion of it is standing and that accessible portion is sort of off to the side, around the corner, not front and foremost, but there are ways that it can feel more continuous with the overall design um, to fully integrate that accessible portion and make the, the public visiting feel certainly more welcome. Looking at the waiting area, we also note um, the open end of the, the seating here, which could make it um, much easier to side transfer should an individual choose to um, from, the, from their mobility device onto the seat itself. An example of accessible kitchenettes and eating areas. Um, at the kitchenette here, we see, um, again, this an accessible sink that provides ample uh, uh, knee clearance. Um, uh, take note of the um, adaptability and sort of flexibility of the, of the faucet and, and the um, controls of the knobs on that faucet, or controls of the levers on that faucet, um, which are operable using a closed fist. And then in the sort of eating area, options for both standing and seated users, just giving that um, uh, choice um, for, for users occupying that space. An example of um, vision strips on fully glazed uh, panels um, that both meet the uh, minimum requirements, but also integrate um, the identity of the space. So this is an example from our current studio with a vision strip that integrates um, various elevations from our from our projects along it, which is quite lovely. Um, and then adjacent to that is this sort of ample um, accessible path of travel in and around our open office area. In um, our more collaboration spaces, we see both standing and seated height options for people. And then thinking about accessible entrances. Um, we see on the left hand side here, um, this accessible entrance and the ramp in particular are absolutely celebrated um, and they're also co-located adjacent to that stairway. Um, throughout this building, signage and wayfinding is also celebrated. Um, color is implemented uh, to give uh, identity to each floor level um, and, and color contrast is also thoughtfully integrated. Another example of an accessible service counter, um, as I was saying in the previous slide, um, sometimes there are service counters that offer both uh, standing and seated interactions, but in this example, um, that seated interaction is right in the middle um, and certainly provides a more welcoming experience. 
Um, in the top right, we see an example of a drinking fountain and water bottle filling station. Um, and these are provided in an alcove just um, offside of an accessible path of travel connected to, of course, um, but ensures that uh, you know, there's no risk of um, protrusion or obstruction of these amenities into the accessible path of travel um, and that users can sort of safely interact with, with the amenity um, without, with, again, without um, the risk of, of being an obstruction while they're sort of waiting there to use the amenity itself. Um, and then another example there just at the bottom right of an accessible service counter example. Some examples of accessible change rooms and showers. Um, it's important to uh, consider that uh, accessible change rooms and showers um, should be provided regardless of the quantity of um, spaces, uh, uh, regardless of the quantity of those elements provided. Um, minimum requirements, for example, um, for accessible showers are such like are such that. Um, they they come into effect when there is more than one but even if there's one that one should be accessible to ensure um, that there aren't any barriers present examples of universal washrooms um, and adult size change tables um, and and understanding where those where those facilities are located in a building um, oftentimes they are located on the ground floor or sort of in the same area as other common amenity spaces within a building, which is great. Um, recognizing that the um, minimum codes and standards um, require space for an adult size change table, really thinking about that install of the adult size change table. Um, I've heard countless scenarios where there are universal washrooms provided, but they haven't actually installed adult size change tables, um, which results in quite unsafe and undignified ways of, of changing and certainly limits an individual's ability to um, experience public space and navigate with ease um, with fear of um, not having those facilities available to them while they're out and about um, experiencing their days. Another example of universal washrooms um, and super graphics here. So um, this is an example of the universal washroom at our current studio um, and strategies such as this are certainly um, what we uh, plan to continue implementing where our studio is moving soon so but the super graphics idea is something that we plan to continue to do it's both helpful from a designer's perspective um, to really see what those minimum accessibility clearances are um, in real space um, in relation to one another. You know, it's one thing to um, observe what those clearances are in drawing sets um, and uh, post occupancy, but really seeing what those are um, allows us to better understand those minimum clearances in real time. Some examples here of uh, child friendly designs, um, uh, a sort of secondary door panel we see. Um, in the on the left hand side image um, with with hardware that is suited for um, children's height um, we see a, a waiting area on the top right which again takes into account the needs of the users of children and their caregivers or parents waiting in this space um, and providing opportunities to make them feel um, entertained <laughs> and included um, and then on the bottom right we see a stairway um, which implements a secondary handle, handrail just below the primary handrail. Um, and this is both helpful for um, children, of course, but also persons of shorter stature just to provide that additional support um, that's at a height that is better suited for them. Some examples of um, child and bariatric friendly designs. On the left hand side here, um, we see a, a corridor with a continuous and graspable um, handrail provided along the way, um, which can be helpful for folks. And then on the right hand side, a waiting area um, that incorporates both um, child friendly um, seating and table arrangements, um, some bariatric friendly seating um, at the foreground there, and then sort of typical um, standard width seating um, throughout uh, the rest of the space as well.
And one thing to note here um, is that the, the bariatric seating has the same color and finish as the standard seating where that is provided, um, that it's provided in such a way that is thoughtfully integrated um, to ensure that it's both identifiable, but again, that it's part of the same seating plan. Examples for age-friendly design and just continuing to think about how older adults and seniors continue to live, work, and play um, in, in, their, in their built environments. This is, is specific to um, residential sort of applications. The idea of areas of refuge um, providing safe and dignified means of emergency evacuation for folks um, uh, who aren't otherwise able to independently exit uh, via the exit stair, um, especially important where you have buildings um, with multiple stories above grade. And then again, we spoke about this in previous slides, but the idea of gender inclusive washrooms, awareness is certainly growing related to this um, and the implementation is coming. I think most commonly we see um, this beginning to be implemented in educational institutions as a start, um, but more and more so more so um, uh, implementing these in, in workplaces as in with regard to multi stall arrangements. Again, um, accessible uh, single occupancy washrooms or universal washrooms um, provide that gender inclusion, but this is done in such a way where it's um, more forward in its approach. Examples of service animal relief areas. Um, both of these examples are from airports. We have an interior application of it um, and an exterior application of it. Um, more and more we're seeing um, the implementation of these types of elements in, in adjacent to healthcare facilities, um, particularly within close proximity to the accessible entryway. And then examples of tactile walking surface indicators. Um, now from a minimum requirements perspective, tactile attention indicators um, are required, pardon me, are required anyway at the top of stairs or at platforms, et cetera. Um, but the implementation of tactile direction indicators, awareness is certainly growing. Um, and there can be a tension about these while they provide access to um, folks with low to no vision, um, particularly those using white canes. Um, it's said that they can be um, uh, problematic potentially for, for folks um, who uh, have, um, who, who may shuffle in their step um, and potentially be a tripping hazard, but in general, um, they have a very rounded profile to them. Um, but again, it's, it's exciting to see them implemented in various um, situations. Um, here we see it leading to a stairway as well as to an elevator. Consideration for uh, technology-based wayfinding um, or sound beacons specifically. Um, now these are just four organizations that um, are on our radar um, at the moment um, that provide uh, smartphone sort of app-based um, uh, connections to these services. Um, and they can be uh, um, customized to the particular location where they're implemented. Um, and it's, it's great when they're provided, um, but they should certainly be used as a um, sort of added layer to a, a strong sort of built environment wayfinding strategy anyway. Um, reason being is that we know that there are, um, uh, you know, equity issues related to um, uh, smartphone access, um, data plan access, things like that. So it's great when they're there. Um, but if, if sound beacons or technology based wayfinding hasn't been provided, um, we should still rely on a really strong strategy in our in our built environment to, to provide that means of wayfinding throughout and signage to contribute to that. Um, here just wanted to highlight the implementation of larger clear turning larger clear turning spaces. Um, there's a lot of evidence based research. This is specifically from the Center for Inclusive um, Design and Environmental Access. Um, 
we see 2100, 2300, and 2500 as available sort of clear turning spaces. Um, in the Ontario Building Code, for example, um, in uh, the barrier free design section, we typically see clear turning spaces in and around 1500 and 1700, um, which are best suited for folks who use smaller manual wheelchairs who are, you know, quite, quite skilled in their maneuverability. Um, one way I like to think about this is um, if you're a driver um, of, a, of a vehicle and, and you're parking, I can just think about how many times I personally take to adjust when I park in a space. So, you know, the, the more clear turning space available, the better. Um, it both makes it a lot easier for the individual to maneuver within that space and access various features throughout that room um, or space, uh, but also will help maintain any sort of um, uh, bangs or maneuverability incidences to, to the elements around. Um, consideration for deaf space. Um, here are just some principles um, from the deaf space project. Um, which was uh, completed in collaboration with the ASL Deaf Studies Department at Goddard University. Um, so consideration for sensory reach, space and proximity, mobility and proximity, light and color, as well as acoustics. Other ways that the built environment can ensure that we feel more included um, is to recognize and celebrate um, queer space. And so here are just some examples throughout Toronto, which include full spectrum, full spectrum, um, the AIDS Memorial, and the steps in Toronto. Um, full spectrum uh, was inspired by the concept of a permanent and infinite queer community. Um, it's a 70 foot long three dimensional wall sculpt sculpture located at the corner of church and Maitland. The sculpture offers visions of both joy and reflection. A rainbow comprising 102 colored panels symbolizes the spectrum visible to the human eye and celebrates the diversity of the queer community while the reverse of each panel acts as a permanent vigil commemorating the lives lost due to HIV AIDS since the 80s. Um, so as you move past the sculpture, the merging of these two sentiments represent both celebration and the ongoing struggles of the queer community. It's just one example. So seeing more of these, having placards um, that, that demonstrate these spaces in the same way um, that we um, see uh, heritage plaques, for example. And then the idea of black space. Um, on the left hand side here, we see a shot from uh, the Africville Museum. Um, would highly encourage you to look up the history of Africville um, in Nova Scotia uh, if you haven't done so already, but the, the museum here is, is what remains of this area. Um, again, contributing to the idea of black space is the importance of um, supporting and celebrating associations and organizations uh, that um, folks who identify as Black working in these sitting building spaces. So there's a photo there from the Black Architects and Interior Designers Association, or BETA. And then um, spaces that uh, celebrate um, Black artists. So we've got a photo designed for um, Black artist. This is the Black Artist Network and Dialogue, or the Band Gallery. Um, and definitely an emphasis on Black creatives showcasing their work in, in this space. The idea of spiritual, multi-faith, prayer or meditation spaces um, and providing these in places uh, um, such as healthcare facilities, educational institutions, um, more and more um, implementation of these is taking place in uh, workplaces. Sometimes these spaces are sort of layered on with, you know, it's it's the spiritual space and the wellness space, and that's okay too. It's just a matter of really understanding who your users are and exactly um, what practices uh, they require to perform within those spaces. Um, the image on the bottom right I wanted to highlight as um, this was a recent uh, discovery that I was quite excited to see and truthfully had never seen um, in the built environment before, but the, the addition of abortion stations um, or, or foot washing stations available um, in the nearest uh, public use washrooms adjacent to the quiet prayer and meditation spaces. Um, so again, understanding who your users are and exactly what design elements um, they require to ensure inclusion. Um, the idea of smudging ceremony spaces to, um, uh, excuse me, 
ensure inclusion of Indigenous experiences. And then the idea of lactation or feeding spaces. Um, the example on the left hand side is from Toronto Pearson Airport and then the example on the right is from a workplace. Um, these are certainly more dignified um, and accessible um, and welcoming environments to perform um, lactation and feeding. Then again, the example I used of sitting on a toilet stall, which was a recent um, situation that someone I know had to go through. Um, inclusive language, identity first versus person first. So the aim here is to use um, inclusive language, um, understanding that some terminology for inclusion may vary across different cultures and regions, but um, just seeing these examples um, of identity first, you know, it may be appropriate to refer to um, disabled persons as disabled persons, but also being cognizant that person first language um, may be better suited to the situation. So alternatively referring to someone um, or a group of people as persons with an intellectual, cognitive or development, developmental disability. Um, but ultimately, it's also just really important to ask people how they prefer to be identified um, just to avoid any issues there. Highlighting inclusive visualizations. Um, we should also be accountable to the narratives we share. While we may just think that renderings of our built environments illustrate buildings and public spaces intended to be provided, they also illustrate the people we intend to include. And if we don't see diverse people um, and people who look like us, we likely aren't um, it, it, we aren't likely to want to go to these places. Um, so this is just an example of a current internal resource of how BDP um, is continuing to think about and evolve the ways in which um, we, we render our narratives related to our built environments. We're near the end, <laughs> stay with me. Um, inclusion in the built environment is a human-centered approach to design that considers how to make a skill seen, heard, and celebrated in the spaces in which we live, work, create, and play. A resource um, created by Airbnb, actually, um, is another lens. So I, these three principles really resonate. Um, these illustrations are kind of fun. Um, but the idea of balancing your bias, considering the opposite, and embracing a growth mindset. So this tool um, helps designers address skewed perspectives in order to create thoughtful and inclusive work. Um, another lens poses a set of questions to help us balance our bias, consider the opposite, and embrace a growth mindset. Each of the questions in the next slide um, that I'll share pose a question intended to shake up our thinking as we design. It's recommended to pick two or three at a time to reframe how we work. While this tool was made primarily for designers, it's believed that all creatives can apply aspects of it to their work. So the next time you find yourself brainstorming, building, or polishing, let me invite you to take a moment to challenge your reasoning. And together, hopefully, we can diminish the effects of bias within the creative process. So some questions uh, to consider here throughout the design process. You may ask, um, what details here are unfair, unverified, or unused? Um, what would the world look like if my assumptions were wrong? Um, who's someone I'm nervous to talk to about this? And what am I challenging as I create this? So just some uh, questions to consider, and they've been sort of grouped related to each of, of the principles from this particular resource. And near the end here, so asking ourselves, who are we designing for? but reframing that to consider who are we designing with and who are we designing with, with compassion. There's no firm threshold that marks one's transition um, from sympathy to empathy when thinking about the spectrum of empathy. So rather the relation between the two is best represented on a spectrum with pity, the most disconnected and abstracted version of sympathy on one end and compassion, the more connected and embodied version of empathy on the other. The spectrum of empathy includes pity, sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Pity and sympathy require little to no effort or understanding, while empathy and compassion require effort to understand and engagement to produce a positive change. Pity is simply when you feel sorry for somebody else, 
you don't like their unfortunate situation, and maybe you'll even do something to rectify the situation, but mostly to make your own unpleasant feelings go away. On the other end of the spectrum is compassion, the feeling where you relate the most to users as independent actors as opposed to objects. Actors in this context means that we recognize that the users have their own purposes, wants, and needs, and that they are acting to satisfy what they want to accomplish, not what we think they ought to do or want. Thus, we don't impose our priorities or preferences upon the users, which would be an act of objectifying them, and that's more characteristic of sympathy. Compassion is a call to action derived from empathy. When our understanding of another's thoughts or feelings give us the compulsion, duty, or desire to help change that person's situation for the better. To conclude, inclusion in the built environment must include better buildings. I'll give you a moment. So that is the end of today's presentation. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, I really appreciate it, and I hope you found some value in learning a little bit more about inclusion in the built environment. Thank you, Haley. Uh, anybody have any questions? Please feel free to um, unmute yourself. You can. You can put your cameras on, it's uh, informal. Could you please show the code again? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> no problem. Oh, one second. There we go. <laughs> OK. Um, we have a chat. From Brianne, that was such an inter interesting presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that I'll share um, that has been the most impactful in the way that I approach my practice, particularly in the last three or so years, um, has been uh, that that relation of, of um, ableism by design in the built environment and relating that to racism by design in the built environment um, and thinking about you know our own um, our own identities um, as an accessibility um, specialist as an accessibility consultant. I'm coming to this as an ally. I'm not currently a person who has lived experience with disability, um, but really pulling from my own experiences as a black biracial uh, woman um, in this space um, it is, has, has, really, has really, really helped. So I would definitely encourage each of you just to take stock of um, your own identities um, and think about both how you experience the built environment and extend that to the intersectionality of ways that others experience the built environment as well. Hi, Haley. Thank Hi you there. so much for the presentation. Uh, no I just had a one question like, uh, is there any uh, code requirement for lactation rooms or children rooms? Because it's such a basic requirement, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this, the space itself isn't specifically called out in the Ontario Building Code, for example. Um, certainly other aspects of the code could be applied with regard to um, the accessible path of travel and um, our approach to, to doorways and doors. And we could look to um, other better practices to take note um, with regard to um, uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment, or if there's a kitchenette included, things like that. Um, uh, but typical sort of better practices for um, for accessibility at this point in time, as far as I'm aware, don't explicitly call out um, those those spaces. Yeah, like. So the the way I think we all would agree that unless and until it's not there in code, everything is done in a bare minimum fashion. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So, yeah. But anyways, thank thank you so much on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for the question and for part and for listening today. Um, I see Santa's question in the chat. Uh, is there a way we can access this presentation later on for references? Um, I believe there will be. Um, yes. And I certainly have a list of references to share on the next slide to go along with that. Yes, that's great. And and um, some of the students have been asking um, for presentations to be uploaded after. We're, if you're okay with that, we may do it, whatever you're comfortable with, but we'll get back to the students on that. Yeah, okay. Any other Thank questions? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Malika, I'm so fascinated by your comprehensive presentation. I agree. Uh, it was a it's it's mind boggling what we don't think about. Um, yeah, it was great. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. Yeah, so um, something I'm wondering is um, throughout this process, uh, the past couple of days, um, they've, so a couple of presenters have mentioned something that happens later on in the process. I forget what it's exactly called, but it's when they um, figure out the budget and then a bunch of cuts need to be made to a project. Um, and then I'm wondering perhaps how you, value engineering, great, thank you. Uh, how, um, I guess someone like you would navigate that stage of the process when perhaps um, another member or something might see some accessibility accommodations as not being important enough to shell out for. Mm -hmm. It's certain, it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, it's certainly um, a negotiation and it, it really emphasizes how important it is to have um, an integrated, coordinated team across all disciplines. Um, and we've, you know, certainly experienced a number of projects where you're right, the, the budget is set, the space planning is set, and then we're thinking about, you know, the project specific specifications specific to accessibility. And, you know, we come in and we're like, there should be 2,500 turning circles. And it's like, cool, cool, cool. But we've only accounted for 1,500. And it's like, all right, is there any way we can put 2,500? That's not all places, but maybe strategic places. And so it's that negotiation and ensuring that um, we're looking out for it as an accessibility consultant, but also that, you know, the interior designer and the architect are all on board for um, pushing for those same better practices for accessibility. 